You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Moving rapidly along the plank road towards Salem Church, we saw no signs of the enemy, but an occasional dead soldier lying along the line of march was proof that sharp skirmishing had been going on. Suddenly we encountered soldiers lying at rest along the road, and soon after, marching by the flank, in four ranks, we filed to the right from the road into a field, and marching a short distance, we heard the order, Left face, forward march, and we were marching in the line of battle towards the woods. Probably scarcely a member of the regiment, except the colonel commanding, knew that the 15th was about to engage in its first pitched battle until some men of the 3rd New Jersey, who were lying along the fence, sang out, Throw off your knapsacks! The regiment approached the woods and entered it, not a shot having been fired, as I recollect. After having gone into the woods about a hundred yards, we were met by a scattering skirmish fire, followed a few seconds after by a crash of musketry from a line of battle probably not more than fifty yards ahead. The regiment halted, and without any general order to fire, the 450 rifles of the 15th responded with a deafening roar to the rebel volley. After the smoke cleared away, I saw two men of the 15th lying dead, Joshua D. Banker and James Hendershot, both shot through the head, and two others, whose names I care not to mention, lying on the ground, nearly frightened to death. In a little time, however, they recovered from their scare, and upon suggestion how to load and fire, both these men went to work and fought bravely through the entire action. The situation was terrific. With our own fire and that of the rebels in front, the thunder of our batteries in the rear, and the crashing of solid shot and shell through the treetops, it was quite impossible to hear a voice. The men kept well in line, and loaded and fired with great rapidity. I saw men, their pieces having become fouled, trying to drive the bullet home by pressing the rammer against a tree, and failing in that, throw down the useless gun, and pick up the rifle of a dead or wounded soldier, and resume their places in the ranks. The fire of the rebels was incessant. Lieutenant Louis Van Barcom, 15th New Jersey Infantry, Brown's Brigade. The news that Sedgwick was rapidly approaching, driving Wilcox's Alabama Brigade before them, cast an air of defiant cheerfulness over the men. Ranks were closed up, the pace increased, and between 3 and 4 p.m. we arrived in sight of Salem Church, a little country church by the side of the road, where a stirring sight awaited us. The enemy, in magnificent force and three lines deep, at right angles to and crossing the road, with flying colors and glancing bayonets, were driving Wilcox's Alabamians, who were gallantly struggling to delay them. There was not a moment to lose. The enemy was almost in possession of the rising ground in front that would have commanded our position. But McClaws was equal to the emergency. Rapidly disposing of his troops to the right and left of Wilcox, our brigade was ordered to the front and left Mahone's brigade in reserve. The moment was critical. We could scarcely reach our line before the enemy. There was no time for brigade movements. Each regiment commander rapidly noted the position his regiment would occupy and rushed for it by the nearest route at double quick. The 50th Georgia, on reaching their ground, found the formation obstructed by a ditch and cedar fence at the edge of the field. 
Leaping over that, like so many deer, the men formed like lightning on the right by file into line. Receiving a terrible fire from the enemy at sixty yards range, and then, with a wild yell, we charged and drove the enemy over and beyond the line in confusion, and ranged up alongside the 53rd Georgia to receive the enemy's next assault. We had lost about fifteen or twenty men, but a more gallant deed I never witnessed. The enemy reformed quickly and, cheered by their officers, advanced again and again to the assault, only to be repulsed with great slaughter. Meanwhile, we were suffering terribly. Three color bearers shot down in succession. Gaps were seen along the line, strewn with dead and wounded. The men steadily closing up the gaps and kneeling were firing with deliberation. The roar of musketry was incessant and terrific. Our rifles were letting up so that they were useless. The men throwing them away would pick up the rifle of some dead or wounded comrade and resume the fight. We had used up sixty rounds of ammunition. The litter bearers were dispatched for more. The wounded left uncared for. I shall have no regiment left, shouted Curse to me. If this lasts a half hour longer. While he was speaking, the men began shouting, "They are giving way! Let us charge them!" It was true. Appalled by the stubborn resistance and fearful punishment inflicted by our troops, the enemy were at last giving way. With a wild yell, the regiment charged, and in an instant, the enemy were in full retreat. Some of the men made a dash at the colors of the forty-sixth New York Regiment. But the gallant color bearer tore off the colors and escaped, leaving the staff in our hands. Captain Peter A. McClashen, Fiftieth Georgia Regiment, Sims Brigade. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 271 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. To most people, Chancellorsville is the story of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson boldly confronting a boastful Joe Hooker and his Union Army. The popular narrative includes Lee and Jackson meeting after the opening engagement on May 1st, 1863 and then Jackson's stunning surprise attack on the evening of May 2nd, followed by Stonewall's loss to friendly fire later that night. The narrative concludes with Lee's triumphant ride into the Chancellorsville clearing on May 3rd, surrounded by his cheering warriors. The related battles east of Chancellorsville are given little or no attention in the popular narrative since they are less about Lee and Jackson and Hooker. There may not be the emphasis on personalities, but the fighting that unfolded at Fredericksburg and east of Chancellorsville is still an important part of the campaign, and as we hopefully showed with last week's episode, it's pretty darn interesting. Yeah, one of my favorite Civil War stories has always been Colonel Allen of the 5th Wisconsin telling his men they're going to charge Maurice Heights and they won't fire a gun and they won't stop until they receive the order to halt, and that they'll never get that order. Goosebumps, Tracy. Goosebumps, just <laughs> thinking about it. Okay. Well, as y'all will recall, by the end of the last episode, the heights behind Fredericksburg finally belonged to the Army of the Potomac. The Sixth Corps had captured its objective, had sent Jubal Early falling back to the south, and had kicked in the door to Chancellorsville. Meanwhile, at Chancellorsville, remember we said that by late morning, even as Hooker had withdrawn his troops, turtle-like, into a more protected defensive huddle, Robert E. Lee had sought to refocus his force and turn it toward Hooker's new line to deliver a killing blow. 
But then a little after noon, a courier from early had arrived with word that Sedgwick had broken through. Lee remained calm. He knew that early at Fredericksburg had been living on borrowed time, so this news wasn't unexpected. Coming as it did now, though, it meant that Lee would have to abandon any idea of attacking the Federal's new line. But on the bright side, with Hooker reeling and off balance, Lee had the luxury of turning his attention towards Sedgwick's breakthrough. Sedgwick may have kicked in the door to Chancellorsville, and he may have had orders to push west as quickly as possible to relieve his beleaguered commander, but after the capture of Marie's height, Sedgwick took some time to get things sorted out to his satisfaction, and when he finally did set out on the road to Chancellorsville, he did so cautiously. Ironically, Sedgwick's careful advance was the result of a flurry of messages telling him to hurry up. Since before daybreak, he had received a bewildering series of messages from Hooker, from Hooker's chief of staff, Dan Butterfield, and from others asking about his progress, telling him he had a clear road in front of him, and of the great opportunity he had to fall upon Lee's rear, and also giving him a mixed bag of news about the battle at Chancellorsville. One said success was was inevitable, while the next predicted catastrophe. Well, Sedgwick wasn't sure what to make of all this, and so, since he had no way of knowing what he might be marching into, he proceeded cautiously, rather than quickly. To make matters worse, the road to Chancellorsville was anything but clear. That's because the fighting at Fredericksburg had attracted the attention of 38-year-old Confederate Brigadier General Cadmus Wilcox. His Alabama brigade had started the morning at Banks Ford, three and a half miles upriver from Fredericksburg, But with little happening there, Wilcox had marched his men toward the sound of the guns. However, as the battle at Fredericksburg had progressed, Wilcox and his Alabamians saw little action. And then, with the fall of Marie's Heights and Early's withdrawal southward, Wilcox stood essentially alone to the west of town. But that meant Old Billy Fixin, as his men called him, was in a perfect blocking position to contest Sedgwick's advance toward Chancellorsville, and Wilcox took it upon himself to pit his 1,800 men against the entire Federal Sixth Corps. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Podcasts. 
As Cedric crept forward out the plank road, he called up fresh troops to lead his advance. Cedric anticipated hard fighting before day's end, and he wanted fresh troops to lead his march toward Chancellorsville. And so there was yet another delay as Bully Brook's division made its way to the head of the column. To Cedric's frustration, it would take Brooks nearly two hours to come up, and those two hours gave Cadmus Wilcox time to prepare for battle at Salem Church, gave Robert E. Lee the chance to start shifting troops east from Chancellorsville, and gave Jubal Early the opportunity to get reorganized and position himself to get back in the fight. At 3 p.m., by the time Brooks' troops arrived at the head of Sedgwick's column, it had been nearly four hours since the Federals had seized Marie's Heights, yet they were still seven miles from their objective. Sedgwick was a good ten and a half hours behind schedule. Hooker had wanted the Sixth Corps in position to strike Lee's rear at Chancellorsville at dawn, but at this rate, it would be lucky to get there by nightfall. Especially since Wilcox was waiting at Salem Church to spring a surprise on the Federals. He had decided to set up shop in front of a ridge line, Salem Heights, six miles west of Fredericksburg. This was the highest ground between the town and Chancellorsville. Wilcox deployed his brigade into line of battle a half mile in front of Salem Heights so that when pressed heavily, he would still have the ability to pull back to the ridge line to his rear. By the time that happened, Wilcox hoped, Lafayette McClaw's division would be on the scene, hidden by the terrain and in a position to surprise the Yankees. You see, just before 3 p.m., word reached Wilcox that the bulk of McClaw's division was marching hard to his relief. Troops from Richard Anderson's division, specifically the All-Virginia Brigade of Little Billy Mahone, would be coming too. So Wilcox just needed to buy them the time they would need to get to Salem Church and deploy. Remember, these were the troops Robert E. Lee had quickly decided to send marching east from Chancellorsville after he received the news of Sedgwick's breakthrough. Exactly. Those Confederate troops were approaching Salem Heights, but now the Federals were coming too. Fortunately for the rebels, the spot Wilcox had chosen represented one of the best defensive positions on the Fredericksburg or Chancellorsville battlefields. The ridge was named for the Salem Baptist Church, referred to in many wartime accounts as either the Brick Church or the Red Brick Church. During the First Battle of Fredericksburg the preceding December, the church housed many refugees from the devastated town. About 60 yards southeast of the church stood a dilapidated log schoolhouse. Confederate infantrymen positioned themselves in both the schoolhouse and the church in preparation for the coming battle. On the western side of Salem Heights ran a line of earthworks, constructed during the winter of 1862-63 by the Virginians of Pickett's Division. The eastern side of the ridge boasted hedgerows, very similar to the bocage of later American battles in Normandy, France, during World War II. Confederates also made use of Jones's Woods, which ran on both sides of the Orange Plank Road. While the crest of the ridge offered many areas for the Confederates to conceal themselves, the eastern approaches, the ground over which the Federals would advance, was for the most part open. As the Federals started to pressure Wilcox's men, Word arrived that McClaw's division was approaching from the west. As McClaw's quickly deployed behind the cover of the heights, Wilcox pulled his Alabamians back to the church and log schoolhouse and used the woods, hedgerows, and old earthworks, too. Wilcox was pushed back to the ridge by Brooks Federals, who were using the plank road as their axis of advance. On the north side of the road was Colonel Henry Brown's fine New Jersey brigade. The brigade had once been commanded by fiery one-armed Phil Kearney, a no-nonsense officer who had whipped the New Jerseyans into excellent fighting shape. On the south side of the road, the bulk of Brigadier General Joseph Bartlett's brigade deployed, one regiment each from New York, Pennsylvania, and Maine. To bolster the line, Brooks sent forward two Pennsylvania regiments from a third brigade. 
The deployment was far from ideal. It meant some units in the front line weren't reporting to their own commander. But Brooks hardly worried about it. After all, he had only one brigade of rebels to sweep off the ridge. Or so he thought. It was nearly 5 p.m. by the time the men of Brooks' command advanced up the gentle slope toward Salem Heights. The 23rd New Jersey and 121st New York headed directly for the church itself. This was the New Yorkers' first taste of combat, but their regimental commander was one of the best and brightest rising stars in the Union Army, Colonel Emery Upton. Upton treated the men of the regiment as if they were cadets at West Point and instilled iron discipline. By the time of Salem Church, the 121st New York was known as Upton's Regulars, and the discipline he had instilled in the men would prove invaluable in the coming minutes. As the New Yorkers advanced, they were hit by a heavy storm of musketry from the 8th and 10th Alabama, who were concealed in the earthworks scratched out over the winter by Pickett's troops. Despite the rebel fire, the men from the Empire State pressed on. With assistance from the 96th Pennsylvania on their left, the New Yorkers managed to clear Wilcox's Alabamians from the school and church. The Confederates counterattacked, though, and the 121st lost six color bearers in rapid succession. The aggressive Upton sought to drive the rebels back, but couldn't do so without support on his right. There, the 23rd New Jersey was having a rough time. The 16th New York swung around the 23rd, though, and pressed forward. Aiding the wounded men of the 16th New York that day was Reverend Francis B. Hall. The unarmed chaplain followed the men of his flock into the battle, and as men fell up and down the line, he did what he could for their bodies and spirits. When the Confederates finally drove the 16th from the field, Hall safely retreated with the survivors. For his actions at Salem Church, Reverend Hall was awarded the Medal of Honor. As federal soldiers from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maine struggled to wrestle the crest of the ridge from Wilcox's stubborn Alabamians, a haze of smoke hung over the scene. Not just the normal powder smoke, but black, billowing smoke from the underbrush of Jones's woods, which had caught fire from the discharges of hundreds of muskets. Just as the men of the 5th Maine and 96th Pennsylvania reached a spot near the edge of the woods from which they thought they could outflank Wilcox's line, they suddenly saw two solid lines of Confederates rise to their feet and deliver a crushing volley. Of that moment, a captain in the Pennsylvania Regiment said, quote, And then the circus commenced. During the Chancellorsville campaign, Lafayette McClaw's division had already seen three solid days of combat. It had led the assault up the Plank Road on May 1st, kept Hooker's attention through vigorous demonstrations on the 2nd, and squeezed the Federal left in a series of assaults earlier that morning of May 3rd. McClaw's had then marched his 6,500 men six miles eastward, and following Wilcox's advice, straight into position on the back slope of Salem Heights. McClaws deployed the Georgia Brigade of Paul Semmes to Wilcox's left. To Semmes' left, McClaws deployed the men of Mahone's Brigade. To the right of Wilcox, McClaws placed the men of Joseph Kershaw's Brigade, and beyond them, at the extreme right, William Wofford's Brigade was positioned. These were the men that the 96th Pennsylvania and 5th Maine ran into, quite unexpectedly, when they tried to flank Wilcox. With the addition of four relatively fresh Confederate brigades, the entire tactical situation had changed. Brooks' division of Federals had outnumbered Wilcox by nearly three to one. But with McClaw's entrance into the fight, it was the Yankees who were now outnumbered by more than two to one. The Federal advance on the south side of the Plank Road was stopped cold. On the north side of the road, the Federals fared no better. 
The 1st and 3rd New Jersey drove forward at the double quick toward the 11th and 14th Alabama when a volley suddenly ripped through their right flank. The fire came from Sims' Georgia Brigade. Sedgwick himself ordered the 15th New Jersey forward and into the action, which is what was described in that account we read at the top of the episode from a lieutenant in the 15th. It was no use, though, and with the repulse of the New Jerseyans, the two rebel officers, Wilcox and Sims, could sense the whole federal line wavering. Wilcox seized the opportunity and ordered his men forward in a counterattack. Not to be outdone, Sims followed suit. In moments, two full brigades of Confederates were rushing down Salem Heights. Federals on both sides of the road fell back. Some men ran for their lives. Others fought in small pockets around resolute officers. Speaking of determined officers, Upton stuck to the heights as long as he could. Even as others in the 121st broke and ran, he hung on. Lieutenant Adam Rice of the 121st New York claimed that the young colonel was the bravest man he ever saw. Upton stayed put until an officer from the brigade staff rode forward with an order to withdraw and a question. Damn you, don't you know enough to fall back? Upton finally relented and withdrew his men. An Alabamian noted that the New Yorkers pulled back, quote, leaving the extreme point to which they have gotten beyond the church, distinctly marked with their dead and wounded lying in line. In fact, of the 453 men he carried into the fight, Upton would lose 276 of them, the highest number of casualties suffered by any Union regiment at Salem Church. As the Federals withdrew and the Confederates counterattacked, Rebel soldiers captured earlier and held in the church were unexpectedly freed by their advancing comrades, and the detachment from the 23rd New Jersey guarding them ended up as prisoners instead. A Massachusetts soldier in Newton's division, which helped cover the retreat, watched the proceedings and said, quote, The rebels had their own way and were advancing with a rush waving their old red rag of a battle flag and yelling like demons. As the Federal line crumbled, the 3rd and 15th New Jersey were the last units on the front line, and they were about to be surrounded. The 15th New Jersey's color sergeant was shot down, and the next man to pick it up lost the flag to the onrushing rebels. To help the stranded Jerseymen, the 102nd Pennsylvania and 2nd Rhode Island and 37th Massachusetts were sent forward. During the ensuing struggle, the Rhode Islanders' colonel recaptured the lost New Jersey flag. It took the concentrated fire from the guns of three Federal batteries to halt the Confederates. Sam's Georgians pressed forward to within a 100 yards of the Union gun line before falling back. Sedgwick himself, rushing to the spot, had directed the artillery fire. It was the fastest Uncle John had moved all day. When the Federal line had collapsed, Bully Brooks had been close to the front, and onrushing Alabama soldiers had set their eyes on capturing the Yankee division commander. Brooks and an aide spurred their horses toward friendly troops and managed to escape unscathed. Fifteen hundred of Brooks' men, dead, wounded, or missing, weren't so lucky. Meanwhile, through the skillful use of terrain and maneuver, the Confederates had suffered fewer than 700 casualties at Salem Church. By 6 p.m., daylight was fading and the firing started to die down. Sedgwick's road to Chancellorsville was obviously effectively blocked. So, like Hooker, he would go over to the defensive eventually falling back to a position to the north of the Plank Road, with his back to the river, protecting his new line of retreat, Banks Ford, which he had captured that day as he advanced west out of Fredericksburg. At any rate, at the end of the day on May 3rd, Robert E. Lee was now fully in the driver's seat. He had bested Hooker and stopped Sedgwick in his tracks. With the enemy rocked back on their heels, it was up to Lee to decide whom he would pitch into first. Would it be Mr. F.J. Hooker or Uncle John? (laughs) 
That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is a back issue of Blue and Gray magazine. Yep, uh, volume 30, issue number one of the late, great Blue and Gray magazine is worth picking up if you're interested in Second Fredericksburg and Salem Church, if only for the excellent set of maps. Don't forget you can find a full list of all our book recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. Just yesterday, we released members episode number 83, and we went way back to Fort Sumter in April of 1861 to discuss the war's very first fatalities, the first of hundreds of thousands of men who would die over the next four years. Anyway, we want to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade who signed on this past week. Kurt, Robert, John, and Scott. Thanks, guys. We appreciate your support of the podcast. And then thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you join us again next week, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.